Okay, I haven't done a bit of content like this in a while. It's looking at, I suppose, coming into winter housing period, uh, why cows value consistency, optimizing biology, to ma optimizing biology, big words, to maximize performance indoors. So look at the needs of the cow. Uh, this webinar or this recording is brought to you by Precision Microbes. Um, so it takes a bit of time to put these ideas together. So it's great to have uh, uh, Precision there in the background supporting this time and effort into something, you know, outside the Precision Microbes range. But just I think it's valuable to put these messages out into the market. This is probably something maybe for farmers, vets or advisors who are looking at the winter and maybe look, this is kind of how I approach a, a checklist type of approach as, I, as I'll explain. Um, so my name is Tommy Heffernan, a veterinary consultant, a lot of experience in the marketplace uh, around and I suppose cow signals and cow biology. Um, I did a no field in 2018 looking at this area of optimized biology and it's really stood to me. Um, I, most of my work now is of course in the microbial space with precision microbes and these are absolute game changers. So just a quick word on precision microbes before we get into consistency in cows. Um, liquid prone postbiotics, game changers in calf health. Um, like they're supporting better gut health. I did the trial work initially, um, blown away by the farm results. Appetite on calves, recovery from diarrhea at higher doses, but calf performance, so you know, average daily gain, reduction in scour, all the things you want to see. But most importantly, I suppose, from a vet's and farmer's perspective, uh, a visual difference in the calves that can see the product working. So a simple message for the spring, um, and that is for calves, for young calves from day one, you can go 30 mils for 30 days. Um, and if there is calf diarrhea during that period, uh, you could top the calves up orally with 30 mils uh, for three days. Um, and what I'm seeing is, you know, reduction in calf diarrhea when they do get a the quick response. Uh, it can be fed through milk and the message is 30 mils for 30 days, starting on day one for your young calves. Um, look, if anybody has any more information before we, go, we get into... Uh, optimizing biology, I'm very happy to answer any questions directly around precision microbes and applications that people have interest, but it's a game changer. So contact me on info at tommydevet.ie. Game changer in gut health. 20 years of veterinary practice. This is by far the most exciting products I've got to work with. Okay, so let's get into the winter topic, improving health. So at the start of my career, I, I certainly looked at sick animals and you know treatments and then got interested in herd health, looked at the different factors that involve drive health on farm, obviously in combination with your vaccinations and your wormers and, and sort of what I was doing traditionally in practice, but I got interested in, okay, what are the other drivers aside of that that affect healthy cows and keep cows healthy? And of course, you need to have the genetics right in your system that, you know, different types of cows for different systems, whether it be fully indoor, outdoor grazing, you know, small cows, big cows, but having that consistency, understanding what the potential of the herd is. But really then the big things I saw that impacted health were feeding in the environment. So I got really interested in nutrition, still am, and in the environment, the impact the environment has on cows. But I suppose... Every farm is targeted, but the big one for me is it's people that drive everything. So as an advisor or vet working on farms, you know, it was about um, working with people to see what could we do uh, on farms and how we could change it and not trying to change everything over, you know, a short period of time. But slow progress uh, beats perfection every time, I think. You know, perfection is very hard to achieve on farm. So people are a huge driver. Um, obviously, Cow Signals is a very important uh, course that I've done and just getting the basics right as well indoors. Um, and disease destroys health. So we want to minimize disease and optimize biology. We still get sick animals, um, you know, and we want to assess that from a response to treatments, um, like all sorts of animal health monitoring systems are, are available now. You know, general rule on treatment, early intervention, uh, supportive care um, really helps a huge potential there, a lesson that I've learned. People are the big drivers, so people are the big drivers, so that's why I use the checklist approach, as you'll see here. It might be useful for maybe vets uh, that are looking at this, kind of how you structure maybe going out and looking at a, and assessing uh, a farm over the winter months. Just my ideas, and I'm very happy to share them. So what am I going to discuss? Understanding the cow to optimize biology and behavior. That's the kind of work I did during my Nuffield. Looking at the factors for particularly as we face the indoors now, cows going in for the winter, what are the challenges? And really looking at my concept of being brilliant at the basics, consistency around feeding and cow performance, doing the simple things really well, which can be the very hard things to do. You know, I, I had a discussion that's off topic this morning about, you know, human, uh, human capacity and performance. It is couple of things we need to do, sleep, exercise, diet, uh, and mind and meditation. And they can be like very simple things to say, but very hard to do. 
And, and you know, if we look at in, in, in our cows, it's actually kind of similar. There's a lot of simple things we need to do well. Um, we can get caught in rabbit holes uh, that sometimes, you know, the basics just need to be done well. So how can we assess this using a checklist approach? This is my approach to it. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I found it very effective to have a systematic approach. And then about you know reviewing the information and taking action because ultimately we can review things and checklist things until the cows literally come home. But it's about how we take action then as well and the importance of it. So I did a Nuffield in 2018. Uh, it was a cow centered approach to modern dairy farming. And the reason I got interested in that was I was actually looking initially at human cow interactions and how we can impact better cow performance. But I suppose what was interesting as I traveled was that the perceptions of animal agriculture uh, from a consumer perspective were very negative, very a bit disheartening. And I, and I said, look, if we look at animal welfare and animal performance in the future, is there option, op, what's the opportunities here? And, you know, by focusing on the animals within an agricultural system, say, for example, the cows now, if you optimize their biology, so give them more of what they want, um, they will perform better, ultimately improves welfare. And it's a good story all around for pro farm profitability, industry profitability, and it's a good story for the consumer. So that's what my no-field was based upon. And it's been really good for me ever since then, as I move again across species uh, doing different work, just to go back to that optimizing biology idea. And again, I came up with this very simple info infographic, but like it's a, it's just about understanding the cow, you know, how quickly she moves. So if she moves, you know, faster than three kilometers an hour, her head's going to be up. She puts her front foot down, follows her back foot where that front foot was, um, and she picks her step. So if we put pressure on the cow, she's, you know, she's more likely to get lame. She likes a certain amount of light. They're a, they're a herd species, so they'll feed together, they'll lie down together. A lot of that herd instinct or herd behavior uh, still is in the cows, so we need to understand that, particularly when we're moving heifers into groups of cows at the winter time. Um, and, you know, just understanding how much time she needs to spend lying down and by optimizing lying times, how we can improve performance and reduce lameness. So really simple things around the cow that have stood the test of time with me as I've learned them. Um, and I think biological optimization is fitting for any animal agriculture system, actually. And always, of course, we know, and I know, there's trade-offs in every system. But if we can maximize a lot of the, opt of the biology and behavior the cows like, well, they're going to pay us back. Because they're going to get less issues with disease, less lameness. They're going to stay in the herd longer. And one thing I've learned is cows love consistency. So they love consistency around routines and behavior, um, which is an interesting, and I'm not, you know, there's pros and cons to robotics, but again, if you look at one of the things when I started working with cows and robotic farms, first of all, was how calm the cows were because they were doing things on their own terms. Now, I wasn't paying for the robots or anything like that, but it is interesting when you look at um, cow behavior around milking robots and the consistency that's provided there. So to me, this is a very powerful slide. I might be on my own thinking that, but um, it just is really good to remind ourselves of what the animals actually in our care want, because if we can optimize that, we can definitely optimize performance and pro pro profitability as well. Again, I looked at this, the human influences on the cow. Um, I probably would make a, a bad stock person um, because, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't always have a lot of these. Uh, I'm, I'm quite impatient, actually, and move too quickly. Um, but just these are some of the things that I would have identified for good stockmanship. And the idea that, you know, if we we're looking at training or maybe staff team members, that this is the sort of stuff we'd look for. The reality on farm I know is that you know labor is a huge shortage we can't be picky but it's kind of the things we need to be thinking about uh, when we think about when we're working with animals to optimize performance uh, and productivity is that you know our interactions with them will, will do a lot of this as or will impact uh, cow performance and these are some of the things I identified. Okay so applying the cow center approach uh, from a no-field and look at the winter checklist Genetics much ma must match the system. So if we, the type of cow we have um, that we're feeding her and we're housing her and understanding that she has certain potential of outputs, um, but what do we need to do to mine that? And then we're, and we see less and less of it, you know, where you have high yielding cows, low yielding cows, and a mixture uh, of cows in the herd. It can be very difficult to manage them. So we must understand the normal biology of the cow first, and that's why my infographic was there. And I'm really interested in this idea of stress gaps. Of course, I love making up words myself, 
But a stress gap is the difference between the biology that the cow wants versus the dairy system delivers. So um, if we know optimal biology, I'm always looking for stress gaps for the cow uh, and, and narrowing them down to try and reduce the pressure. Uh, and to me, disease is a function often of stress gaps. So stress in itself causes immune suppression, but stress gaps can be nutritional, they can be environmental stressors, and that's where disease loves the opportunity to get in. Again, uh, this is a slide that probably jumped in there for somewhere else, but um, communication, we should avoid stress gaps everywhere in farming, but um, yeah, particularly I'm going to focus on herd and flock. What do they want? Um, and obviously the dairy cow today, but what do they want? And then looking at the stress gaps in your system. And that's why the checklist works well for me. So again, looking at the ideal day for a cow grazing or an ideal day for the cow indoors. Um, how does she like to spend her time? How long does she like to spend feeding, maybe milking, socializing and lying down? And it varies whether it's inside or outside. She'll actually graze and eat less when they're indoors and they lie down longer. So if we shorten that feeding window, if we shorten the lying window, well, we're going to see uh, production issues and challenges on the cow then. If we have very, very extended long milking times, well, then there's more standing time for the cow, more pressure on the foot, and that foot is often on concrete. Again, the cow signals um, was very, very useful. One of the best courses I've ever done. And it, it taught me about really looking at animals. And I really, you know, the uh, identifying the standing waiting cow, the cow that's neither lying or feeding indoors, and what percentage of the herd is doing that. Um, looking at risk animals and asking the question, why? So the look, think, act, where's the weak spots? Um, and take an act then. Again, I suppose from an Irish perspective, we're quite lucky. Uh, I've traveled a lot with my work as well, but we, we have a very cyclical grazing season. So I identified that the checklist approach works well at key times. So housing, uh, we're thinking a lot of, about calving time and reducing issues there. Um, as we come to calving, we're thinking about calf health and even looking at breeding. So it's a really cyclical nature uh, to herd health planning. So we can get in in advance if you can work with your vet to get in in advance of, of, of the risk periods, there's huge benefit to it. And that's what I've seen practically. Again, I suppose as my career has progressed, I've got very interesting, interested in kind of maybe getting away from the, the uh, outside the farm and actually kind of looking from a helicopter view and looking, understanding uh, from a per people perspective, how we move performance forward and looking at goals for the farm. What are our current key metrics that we're looking at? What's the current herd performance? And again, checklist, where's the risks? What are the areas that we're you know, not doing well in? Lame cows, cell count, um, maybe reproduction, maybe it's pro production itself, uh, and zoning in on them and, and asking the question why. And it's a very farm specific thing. And I have found by measuring where you are, and this is both at a very human level or a farm or a business level, measuring where you are and kind of seeing where you want to go. Uh, it can be impactful because we do react to goals. We do set, okay, well, I want to achieve uh, my cell count under this, and I've seen that to be a very effective thing. Setting it out over a period of time with a plan. So now I'm going to focus on biology and behavior. Looking at the cows, looking at the environment, what is the optimal biology and behavior for better performance? So this is why kind of I've looked at the checklist, but I found this immensely powerful for both cows, calves, and as a move across, I suppose, different species that I'm working with. Now, again, looking at this, just looking at what the biology and optimize, uh, the, the, the optimal biology is, and say, well, where are the animals and how can we make it better? And they're often very simple things. You know, it could be straw, fresh air and space or, or some of the things I talk about, which are intuitively, intuitively i suppose quite simple but not always achieved they're not always looked at first and again this is a really important one when we look at uh, infectious disease um we're always we had mastitis or infectious lameness or pneumonia or calf diarrhea we're trying to balance or the seesaw principle as i call it again he, tommy loves the names is we're going to maximize immunity on one side and drive down infection pressure on the other uh, other side so we're trying to tip this scale down reduce the amount of levels of infection that animals are exposed to and prime and optimize the immune system so it's capacity to deal with infections when they are there because of course in farm environments there's lots of infection pressure but we're trying to be smart about how we reduce that infection pressure and then by looking after the cows we're trying to optimize and build that immunity and resistance to infections so again if we look at the checklist approach, this is just my checklist and I'm very free with my information. I'm very happy if people think this is good, bad or indifferent, but I have found these a very useful way 
um, of identifying when you have a system. So when you have a number of issues going on with cows going indoors, there's a number of variables that we need to keep an eye on and that creates a number of risks. So with a number of variables and numbers of risks, we want to identify them. And I just use very simple systems around um, areas that are working well. So I've learned that uh, the hard way that the greens are very important. So we must recognize when we're doing things well, that's both at a farm level or when we're advising people, looking at the different areas that, um, that need to improve, um, but also looking, this is what's been done well. And when we look at the risk areas, the priority, the priority can come from, it might not be my priority, it might be what can we do right now, what's the easiest thing to do, what's the quickest win, what's a long-term challenge that we need to do. And it has been a very effective methodology to identifying problems. So this is kind of where I'll approach the winter checklist. So when we look at the risk assessment or any risk assessments, um, and I suppose I'm very lucky to be involved in so many different areas of veterinary and uh, animal performance and, and get to work on some exciting projects. And uh, we can apply this anywhere. We're kind of looking for bottlenecks, essentially, with checklists. We're looking for weak links in the chain that restrict flow um, that are going to cause problems if they break. Um, and that will mean you know, the interconnected nature of cows uh, and our system is, you know, if we have an issue pre-drying off or pre-calving, well, that's going to have an impact maybe on colostrum quality and calf health. So we want to identify these things early, and that to me is the proactive approach. So the weak links is what we're looking for. So what's on my checklist? The systematic approach, everything is linked. So the lame cow, she's more likely to get clinical mastitis. She's more likely to get sick. Um, just all of this is interlinked. So identifying the big risks. And this is a very important rule for me, the 1% rule. This idea of progress over perfection. So slow change over time is really important. So we, under, we overestimate what we achieve in a year and underestimate what we can do in maybe five or 10 years. So a lot of our challenges may involve you know, more space, more concrete, whatever it might be. Um, but having that long-term view that, okay, that's something I need to look at long-term. And again, you can look at these problems and you can cost, cost them out based on the, the, the impacts they're having on production as well. Uh, and then I love, of course, getting out on farm and looking at this approach, even though I do it less and less. But um, again, I, even when I do get out uh, a lot less, I still have a process that I can just fall back on, uh, like riding a bike that allows me to get out there and, and go through it systematically. And that's why I do a lot of uh, my training is based around these checklists. So on the checklist, the first thing we've got to look at is the cows. And I always say to people, and it took me a long time to learn this, is you've got to look at the cow from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. Like the nostrils are the gateway into the lungs. Is there, you know, is there, is there uh, snots on the nose on one cow, two cows, 20% of the herd? Are the cows coughing? Is there any lumps or bumps on the cows? Um, is there hock lesions? Um, is there, you know, the bump here? Why is they occurring? What's rumen fill like? Uh, what's the tail like? Any discharges? Uh, what's the other like? What's the feet like? What are the cows actually telling us? So in an individual level, start looking at one cow, two cows, three cows. Um, and they are, to me, whether it be cows, calves, pigs, sheep, cattle, they're the most important indicator on the farm. They tell us so much visually looking at them. So we're seeing signals and we're saying, what are we seeing? Uh, is there any visible patterns, you know, um, from a behavior point of view, um, you know, from a, why is the cow not lying down? You know, there's lots of feces on the back of the tail, on the legs here, um, the cubicles might be a little bit short, but why is she standing up? Why is she not lying down? Why is she nervous? I mean, body condition score assessment, of course, we like to get our hands on from a body condition score perspective, but I think we can tell a lot visually from looking at cows, looking at cover of fat and the ribs, etc. Um, and the value here, I suppose, and I love creating content for maybe younger farmers, younger vets or advisors, is this huge value in looking at the normal. So really kind of looking at healthy animals to see what's normal. Again, any lame cows, uh, particularly indoors, we want to look at hygiene because feces is the risk. Um, that's where all the bugs are. And we try and minimize that down if we can. Any marks or bumps or lumps or bumps on the cow that's telling us something about the environment, nasal discharges, other discharges, and you know, coughing, uh, listening. So it's a very visual assessment um, to quantify the risks uh, with cows. Indoors, when we look at cows, Q1 
cubicles are really important. So bed per cow. So we had a rapid expansion in Ireland, probably post quota, where cow numbers went up. And we're now at a phase where people are looking at probably having a lot of times optimal numbers. Now we want to optimize those for those numbers. And okay, we talk about being a grazing system, but a cow spends um, the most important part of a production life cycle in the year lactation cycle in the year indoors so that three or four weeks coming up to calving calving indoors and maybe milking indoors early on and um, depending on the weather so it's a really important part of her lactation cycle that sets her up for the full lactation so we want to maximize comfort indoors and we want to really make sure that we have occupancy rates so we want to, over a cubicle per cow but a minimum cubicle per cow because if we have that remembering they're a herd species they lie together and they eat together and they feed together so we want to have those cubicles available for them to lie down and then like any bed uh, like my own bed at home that you know when you actually lie down in the bed that it's comfortable um, a, a teacher of mine once said to us in, in fourth class, he said, two most important things you can have is a good pair of shoes and a good mattress because you spend your life in both. Uh, so for the cow, that, that bed is really important. And we looked in at our cubicles and we can see, is there many cows lying down? Is there many cows feeding? And what are the idle cows? So what percentage of cows are just standing around? Uh, and we call these the standing waiting cows. Um, and if we do see a lot of cows standing at cubicles, why? So we might sometimes have optimal cubicle numbers, but the bed and the size of the cubicle, cubicle can be an issue. So it's a very visual observation of cows indoors. Again, cow comfort, the environment that the cows are in. Uh, again, they're in on concrete, so we want to avoid slippy floors. Um, you know, a lot of people now are going for rubber in high traffic areas, so that can be in the milking, um, in the milking parlor, uh, around water troughs, maybe at feed faces, because uh, hooves and concrete, it's hard on the cow. And where there's a lot of standing pressure and standing time, if we can do anything to alleviate that, that's good. So we're trying to maximize cow comfort. And the cow comfort piece, cows will pay us back. So again, in the indoor system, we're visually assessing this as well as we go along. So this is a huge one for me, um, is space. It is a massive bottleneck. Um, and space is particularly indoors around passageways, crossovers, feed space where water is, um, because cows have these very unique hierarchies and behaviors. And the more space we give them, the more that they'll uh, um, demonstrate natural be behaviors and feeding behaviors. You know, you can have a crossover here with a bully cow that can impact maybe cows getting to the feed phase. We just need to look at space. Uh, space costs money, um, but if it's a limiting factor, um, certainly some of the newer sheds that I've been in and everyone can't build new sheds they've really optimized for more space and the farmers would say that it's been a game changer um, and again the, the, the real high traffic areas around cubicles water in particular is space uh, and feed space itself and just looking at cow flow around the farm particularly if you're milking cows indoors you're bringing cows to and from the parlor what cow flow is like there uh, in collecting yards etc so hygiene and mindset. Uh, one person's clean is another person's dirty. I often make the joke that uh, this was my um, kitchen in college and this is what my kitchen at home looks like now. You know, I, I wouldn't be the clean, well, I wouldn't be, that's a terrible thing to say about myself. You know, I would be quite, um, I, I can let my environment around me go quite messy. Um, and, but you know, I find that I have to actively keep things tidy and organized. And if I can do that, it's a shift in my mindset, but it makes a huge difference to my, my performance. If we look at hygiene on a farm indoors for the winter, again, it might be natural to all of us to go into that detail. And we know we all have been on farms where you can eat off the floor and they get a lot less issues. So that focus can be a shift in mindset when it comes to hygiene, but it can pay dividends. And it can be weak areas and this can be a risk area and it can be challenging sometimes when you're going out advising people. But, you know, it is a, you're, you're not actually talk about your change in the environment but you're changing a whole mindset um, but when we understand the impact of heavy infection pressure environments well it can make a huge difference so assessing the environmental hygiene will be part of the process I mean shit is the risk but shit is everywhere uh, so dung and feces has all the bugs so how do we reduce down the, the, the pressure well we want to reduce heavy build-ups so having slatted units having scrapers working um, I love those little uh, automatic guys who go around scraping up. I mean, they do a super job and they're spotless. Again, having your scraper working, um, 
drainage and fresh air so like when we have animals indoors maybe on straw getting drainage right having air going into sheds you know air is a fresh air is a fantastic thing and what we can do with bedding and liming um this is actually environmental microbes here have been fogged out in the environment it's the next phase for precision microbes one of our many ranges of products and these are really interesting we're controlling the environment like a petri dish here um with actually good bacteria fascinating stuff so but we are we are looking at environmental hygiene because we're trying to reduce infection pressure it's not just being pernickety it is on this back to the seesaw infection pressure we're trying to lift up immunity we're trying to tip down infection pressure uh, and bacteria like mild wet damp conditions so they're the kind of conditions we see mastitis bugs we see those feet, uh, issues around the feet and infectious lameness and um, so it does make sense focusing on environmental hygiene again we can look at cows the cows will tell us um how clean the environment is uh you know there's always going to be a little bit of dung around the fetlocks and lower feet but it's if it's up in the hocks and the backside well is it an environmental issue or is dung too loose you know simple things like singeing other hair can be i i think it's very beneficial and something we started i started advising people to do in practice because you know those hairy udders can contain a lot of feces and if we come up to drying off in particular it makes it easier to keep the bag and the other clean um but yeah one of the things I see with dirty cows indoors can be maybe on silage diets where they're very, very loose. Again, it can be low dry matter, maybe chaplain or something like that. We just need to look at the cows. And I'm not saying this is the right or wrong approach. This works for me. But again, asking the question, why? Because if we can minimize the exposure to infection like the T10, well, then we can minimize mastitis risk, particularly indoors. Again, fresh air. What a fantastic tool this is. It's nature's great tool, not just for drying clothes or good at getting out and walking ourselves. Um, it really helps reduce the, the burden of pathogens in the environment because if we've got a clean, dry, dry, particularly dry area, there's less risk of bacterial multiplication. And we have this obsession with, I suppose, getting temperature right really interesting when you look at the difference between calves and cows so calves have a different thermoneutral zone which is a temperature that they optimally perform on so we have to be very careful with open with fresh air in calves but with cows it's different or adult ruminants because they're producing so much heat and um, they're actually they actually like are more comfortable in cold temperatures so having optimal airflow through sheds makes a huge difference remembering what bacteria like and again open sheds and again from even open sheds from a light perspective um, makes a huge difference so you should be able to sit down in your cubicle and read your newspaper in the middle of your shed and that's the kind of lighting you want to have uh, in a shed um, cows do like uh, people look at led lighting and optimal lighting times you know looks and all that and that is something that certainly you can refine on farms and particularly when cows are indoors all the time but if we generally have fairly open sheds um, you know everyone's probably maybe post the snowstorms of the past that that fear so overhangs uh, and maybe systems in place that you know you can actually close up sheds but i think more open sheds certainly work and that can be okay that can be very dependent on where we position sheds and protection and shelter but fresh air is an important thing to assess indoors okay so the next thing i look at with cows indoors is lameness this is my hoof check checklist so everything's got a checklist with tommy um it's one of the biggest challenges for dairy cows and we look at reducing pressure on the foot is the lameness infectious or is it functional and mechanical so mostly it's both so infectious lameness can be martellaro or fowls and if we're seeing a lot of that we need to really focus in on the environment uh, or is it mechanical so it's white line disease is it ulcers is it uh, foot abscesses what are we seeing there and a lot of the times where is it where are they on the feet a lot of times by the time you look at the cow's environment and look at cow behavior you can identify that uh, i saw it recently on, on um on cows that were standing a lot cubicles were a little the cows that got too big for the cubicles standing a lot perching a lot a lot of pressure in the back feet and that's where they were seeing more sole ulcers again what percentage of the cows so mobility scoring that's walking cows past us and it's not just the cow that's carrying the foot it's really i think something a lot of people should get better at is the mobility scoring it's very valuable because the earlier we identify lameness the better because if we think about the lame foot and we think about our own nail, if you ever got a bang of a hammer and a bad tradesman like me, a bang of a hammer on the nail, this real pressure goes inside. It can be very, very sore. 
the hoof is encapsulated with lovely soft tissue bony structure so if we have inflammation there getting it in it's encapsulated which creates an awful lot of pain and we can we see that with cows where you pair a foot abscess and that abscess bursts out the drop as we call it here in ireland that drop bursts and you can see a massive difference uh alleviating pain so it's a very strong it's a very um encapsulated structure and um, the quicker we identify the cause of lameness and give relief brilliant um, but you have to look at what type of lameness you're seeing and then it's probably a whole different assessment but again identifying lameness is something I'd always be looking at indoors particularly as well I suppose it's a really key time for foot bathing and correct foot bathing so having the foot bath in an easy place to use the cows travel through it everyone gets obsessed with the agent that goes into the foot bath but what's really important is you get good cow flow you get through them uh, proper you know they, they flow through it the foot each foot goes through it twice and that it's topped up regularly at a litre um, per cow passage. So if you have a two litre, 100 litre foot bat, uh, you have 100 cow herd, two passages of the herd, uh, and you change it again. So again, simple things like having it near maybe somewhere where you can actually uh, easily empty it. Uh, I quite like the automated foot bats, I have to say. I find them very effective when I see them on farm. No affiliation. Fecal consistency. Again, this is really useful thing to look at indoors um what is the dung telling us so you know why is the dung loose so first thing loose dung um what percentage of animals and again we should hear that nice clapping effect of dung and um, because if we've scuttery spluttery dung it's going everywhere it's increasing uh, infection pressure but also it's in it's a sign that digestion's not a hundred percent we don't want to see overly hard dung again in the front of cubicles we don't want to see cud balls or uh, regurgitated cud balls that rumen health is you know they, they often come hand in hand you'll see loose dung and a lot more cud balls in, in a shed where there's digestive issues so rate your shit uh, rate your dung see what percentage of dung is normal um and in, in our Irish system, I definitely see with silage, we can have looser dung. Um, and something we need to keep, just be careful to manage as well as maybe chop lint uh, of silage. Um, ideally, again, in a spring system, it's ideally, you know, you'd be looking at having optimal body condition uh, at a certain time of the year. And, and that cows, you know, wouldn't need that high quality silage, maybe that, you know, that milking silage during the winter period and, and maybe more fibrous silage coming into certainly drying off it's something we need to look at in the future again way too much information for one uh, one presentation but the dung tells us an awful lot so it's again about going in looking at the dung and asking the question why is it loose so this is a fecal sieve i'm not sure where i robbed this picture off but i robbed it from somewhere um and again it just it's a way of looking at feces and looking at the particles uh, and there's a certain breakdown we'd like to see so that's something that nutritionists will do with farmers and again, it's a very useful thing to do. Fibre is a very important component of rumen function. So if we see very loose dung, um, we're, we're seeing, you know, subacute rumen acidosis maybe. Um, we look at chaplain, we look at fibre digestion, um, and this is the next level up the nutritionist will do. And it's a really useful tool to assess, um, I suppose, digestion. And, and it's like, we're thinking about the cows, the ruminants, um, big fermentation bat. We want that optimally performing at all times for the cow's sake. So indoors, another huge thing we will look at is feed space per cow. So when we want a cubicle per cow minimum and we want a feed space per cow indoors. Um, now that's not always achieved and people will say, oh, do I need that with dry cows? And you know, they have space there. It is where we'd optimally like to be going. Um, and particularly when you have cows milking indoors when to maximize feeding time. So that's the space per cow, a certain size, you know, um, heifers is a really interesting one as well because when they're introduced to the herd ideally you want to introduce your herd, my own like if you have a big herd you'd run them maybe separately for the first year ideally but you know in practical terms most herds will bring in the heifers uh maybe 50 60 days before calving time and let them uh, acclimatize and get into the group not ideal to introduce them at the point of calving i think that's quite stressful but heifers really do suffer um in the environment because they're trying to get into the social hierarchy they're looking at feed space there so again having space for heifers and i think that's one thing um but really looking at optimizing um if you can um the actual feed barrier itself so is the barrier impinging on the neck that's you know i so often see it 
that the barrier is too low you'll see marks on the cow's necks just observe them so imagine if you were going for your porridge in the morning and I, uh, someone was pushing at you in your chest and you were trying to eat your porridge so we want to just make it as easy as possible for cows to feed and then if we have feed space try and optimize that there's feed in front of the cows when we need it and pushing it up um, so feed space per cow optimal feeding conditions at the feed phase uh, and you know everyone gets obsessed about what's in the feed but this will drive intakes in and we can dive into the feed and put whatever, whatever you want into it in after that okay so the next thing we look at after feed space is feed consistency um, is there selection of feed what are intakes like we can do a deep dive in ingredients and your nutritionist is best place to do that but like actually having available fresh feed so push-ups are really important particularly if we're trying to milk cows indoors um, actually having available feed and pushing it up just watching cows eating you know are there cud balls in around the front of, of cubicles um, what are cows doing are they is there actually feed there for them particularly i suppose more probably very relevant for milking cows are more intensive or higher producing cows that so they always have fresh feed in front of them um, really important when we look at the the indoor feeding i suppose perspective so feed management you know 30 inches depending on the cow size just observing cows eating reducing feed waste so when we're putting out feed that we're not throwing away feed um fresh consistent diet push-ups uh, timing you know before milking maybe if cows are indoor that push-up uh, re removing waste that's ideally daily but not always done avoiding feed sorting so are the cows if you're particularly pushing cows indoors um watch the cows are they starting pushing feed around looking for pockets in the feed bunk um and look some people talk about plastic screeds and floors and stuff like that for the feed for the feed bunk useful i think just data there saying that it might help intakes but um it wouldn't be where i personally go i just make sure that there's fresh feed in front of the cows they can get at it without much stress okay something i always check indoors not if you've listened to me before i've talked about this before water it's the forgotten mineral or nutrient um, nutrient probably a better word for it um, and we think about our ruminants they're large fermenters a key ingredient in that fermentation process in the rumen is water water is at a cellular level is such an important macro uh, nutrient now here is just an oxygen meter looking at water i've done a lot of water investigations and uh, looking at water troughs and again oxygenation just having flow rates right keeping troughs clean um, you can see down the bottom right hand side there you know looking at dirty troughs the pathogens we can pull out of it versus clean troughs um, you know I, I have these plates that identify mastitis pathogens can sometimes find them in water whether that's that's just Tommy doing a bit of work now it's not a published research but again it makes sense that we have clean available water uh, space around it at the right height, height for cows again love watching cows just drinking from a water trough seeing how easy they can do it uh, tip over troughs to keep them clean regularly cleaning them once a week if you can and you know if i look across species at water treatment it's certainly something that in pigs and poultry they've got really good at and focusing on the water quality and they will treat it water um, i've done some research in that particular area and i think it is something definitely of interest in the future but for the moment get the basics right flow rate clean water available plenty of it uh, space around water troughs at the right height so again herd performance uh, indoors increasing cost of feed milking over the winter uh what we can do to improve efficiency a lot of pressure on input costs um so if we're looking at you know autumn calvers peak milk sets the lactation curve under feeding cows to save money indoors not a good idea so you know again basics know your costs um but getting the basics right diet forage fiber is really important the forage of course energy protein um fats amino acids minerals um but like if we're feeding tmr indoors to herds um really getting that right if we're milking cows over the winter push up feed and feed space again basics of nutrition um but like the idea that the rumen is a fermentation bat it's really key simple like so we've our liquid zone we've our fibrous or sorry our semi-solid zone and our fibrous mat so um microbes are incredibly important and i love the microbes um water is a key ingredient you know fiber is still a really key ingredient for ruminant diets energy uh, protein getting that right minimizing subacute rumen acidosis um just rumen health the dung coding um feed behavior rumen fill really simple things we can look at um yeah, when we're looking at our cows and again 
looking at the farm performance, what uh, what's the genetic goals or the potential of the herd? What are the production goals? Where are is herd performance from a solid basis, and how is it fluctuating up and down? Uh, what's interesting now is when you look at these animal health monitoring systems, looking at rumination, I think there's a lot of things going on, um, particularly in an area I've become interested in. This pH of rumen has been quite low. Talked to some vets about that in the lab. Uh, really interesting conversations. Uh, and again, if we optimize ruminal health here, microbial health, um, precision microbes, we're actually involved in uh, a cattle trial at the moment. So we've moved from our success in calves and different species. We're looking at cattle and really exciting to see can we optimize ruminal and digestive health um, by microbial means. So um, just getting the rumen right is really, really key. Of course, the winter time, particularly with cattle coming indoors. Uh, we've bought internal and external parasites. So again, your own farm history will give you an idea of what the challenges are. We're seeing more, unfortunately, of rumen fluke. And again, I'm not giving any broad sweeping statements on rumen fluke. This is a very individual farm by farm um, uh, assessment done with your local vet. Um, but screening tests are useful. I think liver screening in bulk milks is, is quite, liver fluke is a really, very, very useful screening test, essential one. Um, how effective are treatments? Is there any resistance issues? Um, fortunately, seeing a bit more uh, mange uh, and lice issues in cows indoors. Um, so this is an area you work with your vet, but it's something you'd assess in the indoor system. What's your risks? You could do a whole lecture on parasites, but it's part of that systematic approach. If cows are very loose, is it a parasite issue? Do we need to be doing dung sampling? Um, what are the cows telling us from a fecal consistency point of view? If performance isn't up to scratch, why is it not up to scratch? Are parasites in the mix? Again, vaccinations and diagnostics. It's a good time to reassess maybe planning for the winter, measuring and managing. So measuring where you are in some shape or form through diagnostic bulk milks. I found blood screening is good in the past. Um, and then managing what is the risk when you're using vaccinations value for money. Um, again, uh, veterinary advice here. But one thing I'll say about vaccines is just if you are purchasing vaccines, please store and use them correctly. So timing them right is really essential and storing them. They're expensive medicines and they're very valuable. Uh, store and use them correctly um, is my main message there. But again, each farm will have slightly different risks around salmonella, IBR, respiratory disease, uh, leptospirosis, BBD, uh, and again, understanding what's um, what's the best protocol. And again, that each farm needs a specific plan there done with their own vet. Finally, in the checklist here, um, rumen and gut health. So we talk a lot about the rumen, as I did, but we know we're seeing some issues with subacute rumen acidosis, other, er, other indications that um, leaky gut is going to be really interesting. So I'm heavily involved in research now at the moment on the cattle and cow side as well on leaky gut. I think it's, it's an area to watch. So leaky gut essentially is where we have... Um, in the intestines, we have got this uh, under our permeability increase leading to these toxins and immune dysregulation. And I think it's it's one to watch, particularly where high bypass starch uh, with cows. I think it's, it's an area of interest. OK, so I've covered a lot in the checklist. You can see that, yeah, there's a lot of different elements there that we need to look at. Um, and finally, indoors milk quality. So, OK, a lot of people are going to be drying off cows indoors for the winter. Um, but if we are milking cows, even if we have got dry cows, it is the bag that pays the, mill, the bills. Um, we need to look at cell count. It's a great opportunity when you're drying off cows to assess uh, cell count, um, review clinical mastitis issues. And when it comes to mastitis, um, I do a lot of work with this training program, other things. Um, uh, I work with Ryan Duffy from HIPRA on this recently, and uh, look, it's a really nice program. And um, source and spread. So we want to reduce the source of infection, and with cell count, that's really look at parlor, the cows, milking routine, um, infection pressure, looking at the environment, and then overall looking at cow immunity, anything that could be affecting cow immunity. So it's part of that checklist approach as you go into the winter months. Again, I think this is the final one on the checklist, supplements and additives. There's so many things you could be giving cows, um, but one key message here is forage analysis. So knowing what your winter feed is like, energy, protein, um, and assessing mineral risk. So we see more and more milk fever. We can get silage analyzed or forages analyzed, silage particularly, to see if there's uh, high potassium, um, other risks on the DCAD scale that we can look at now and assess and plan ahead because milk fever after 
uh, energy um, is one of the big metabolic challenges. Um, I'm obviously involved in the microbes area. You might have picked that up. We're doing some really interesting research there. Uh, again, you can have yeast, cultures, buffers, menensins, um, different supplements you can use, minerals. Um, but again, it's a farm by farm basis. Um, it's sort of the fine tuning, but I would definitely say forage analysis is something I'd, I'd be stressing people to do at this time of year. So again, just it's an overview. Some people might find this useful. Um, again, the checklist is use, useless without action. So well, you know, what are the challenges on the farm? Uh, using the reds and yellows wisely, where do we need to improve? What can and will you do? Um, I think that's an important question. And if you're advising, you know, what, if maybe a veterinary uh, advisor, what recommendations would you make prioritizing down, writing them down and reviewing them? So this constant effort of progress, I found that very useful. Keep it simple, focus on what's working, what actions will be done, and we need to review them. And that's the way, the way I've certainly built it out. Um, okay, so that's my winter checklist. Hopefully, it's probably a little bit long, but um, I like thinking out these ideas and I like sharing them. Um, finally, thank you to Precision Microbes. I'm more like one of those fancy, um, uh, those fancy, um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and they have the sponsors come on at the start and the end. So Precision Microbes um, is a game changer in calf health. I think just my message for farmers on this one is it's such a unique product, uh, supporting better gut health. Um, simple message for calves, you've got to try it. 30 mils for 30 days, starting on day one, uh, can be fed in milk, um, anyone who wants any more information on this, I'm really happy to answer questions around dosing and challenges. Um, we've advanced gut stabilizers for calves as well. Um, so look, really exciting products. I think they're going to game changers in the gut health space. A lot of farmers would already be using or have heard of them. If you used them last year with calves that had diarrhea and you saw a response, then you've got to, got to try the 30 mils for 30 days. Um, that's it. Thanks for listening to my winter um, essentials checklist and hopefully it'll be of some benefit. Just again, uh, maybe if you're a farmer or your advisor or vet looking at maybe an approach to winter housing, it's a good time to start a review, taking a look at the cows. It really pays off to try and optimize biology in the short term and if you're long term maybe investments in, uh, in the yard and facilities that it's a cow focused one. Give the cow what she wants and she'll give you back in spades. Uh, thanks for listening. Happy safe farming everybody.